If you want to turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter, uh, we will finish chapter 2 this evening. Uh, a couple different things that I didn't mention when we first got started. Um, one is Andy and Joe are back. They're actually here with us from their deployment. So that's exciting, and we're glad that they're back. And Glenn is also back, but he's not here um, so that's a really great thing. Colin, um, those of you that continue to pray, is still there. Um, he has a, a month or so. Um, and so just continue to pray for those guys who are deployed and come back. And we're glad that they're here. Also, um, I was gone this last week. And uh, it was a great week to be in San Francisco and just to enjoy um, everything that is San Francisco. My class was actually pretty easy this time around, and so I got to explore San Francisco a little more, I got to see some food trucks, and um, got to experience, I really got to nerd out on my fourth passion, maybe, which is coffee, and so um, I, got to, I got to enjoy um, a, a, meet a new friend, her name's Jody, and she actually has a very rare coffee certification as a, as a world taster. She actually tastes coffee for big, huge coffee buyers to say this is the quality of coffee and all that stuff. She has a very specific coffee certification. And uh, so she did a cupping for us, and it was a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. And if you want to know more about it, I won't waste your time now, but I'll tell you a lot more about it later. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and thank you, Shannon, for being part of not only this community, but being willing to share God's um, giftedness in your life and, and really share your heart on who Peter is and really the profile of what it means to be a shepherd and how do we get to know this man that we're studying and this letter that we're trying to understand. And I think Shannon's um, view and perspective as he continued to move us towards a complete understanding of Peter was very helpful. So thanks for, for being part of that. As we continue in this process, I did kind of leave you on a cliffhanger um, two weeks ago and and uh, Shannon was able to kind of create some buffer there as many of you were kind of wrestling with the reality. And the reality was this. Redemption is, in fact, our culture's only hope. Um, as you look at culture, as you look at the environment in which we live, it is complete and total chaos. The reality is um, it is hostile to the truth of Jesus, to the gospel, um, and to our desire to live a different life that is moving towards holiness. Culture wants to create the chaos in our lives so that we cannot move towards the holiness that God has provided. As we have journeyed through Peter's letters in 1 Peter and now in 2 Peter, what he's challenging us with is the reality that we have to engage culture. We have to begin to understand culture in such a way so that our lives can show this marvelous light that is the gospel as we have moved from our old selves to the new selves that have been given to us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. But he's also there to remind us that there are so many distractions. And that oftentimes the distraction just isn't the absolute chaos of culture, but the distraction actually takes place through the subtle and sometimes not so subtle false teaching that takes place around us a lot of times and even within the church. And so what is our um, responsibility to understand that and to discern that and to move forward in the truth that Scripture represents. As we move from finishing chapter 2 and we get into parts of chapter 3 this evening, we're going to wrestle and, and be excited about this concept that we must never forget. Redemption is culture's only hope, and we must never forget this presence of Christ that he has given to us as we have become his children. Peter continually uses the phrase and uses the word remind. Remember this. Be reminded of this. And so we're going to camp out on some of those things. But before we do, we need to kind of bring back the heaviness of chapter 2 and get ourselves involved in the text. So I'm going to start um, verse 15 of chapter 2 to get us engaged in the fullness of what God has for us. Starting in verse 15, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked 
For his own transgression, a speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. So hopefully you're kind of getting in tune with where we were two weeks ago. Verse 17. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome the last state has become worse for them than the first, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it turned back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. The fact of the matter is, as verses 1 through 16 of chapter 2 really described, this is culture. This is the reality of the perversion that sin causes in God's creation. Verses 17 through 22 really show the impact of false teaching or the impact of culture on us, on other people especially those who are trying to at least understand some form of spirituality. As we get involved in verse 18, this is what it speaks. It speaks of three different things concerning really how people respond to this type of false teaching. The first is this. Culture or false teachers speak with such confidence that the weak think they must know what they are talking about. I mean, as you begin to think about just the reality, if you're a student um, and you go to a place of higher education and you find yourself sitting at someone who has a PhD in a certain particular topic and they are the experts and they begin to look down on you because of your quote unquote, and we talked about this two weeks ago, because of your simple faith, they begin to mock you, they begin to make fun of you, they begin to say, how on earth could you believe in something as simplistic as, and they fill in the blank, you begin to question, yeah, how on earth do I believe in something as simplistic as fill in the blank? Because they're the experts, because they have the degree, because they've spent years researching, and here you are as an 18 to 21-year-old, if you're in your undergraduate program and you're going, how do I stand up against the tide of culture that says what I believe is not true? Those are difficult things. And it's difficult to be the only one in class that stands up and says, I don't believe in and fill in the blank. I do believe in and fill in the blank. That's difficult. Or if you're in the workplace and the normal protocol at work is to talk about the other people at work and you find yourself at the copy machine or you find yourself at the desk or you find yourself in the workshop or you find yourself wherever you are and culture begins to talk and you begin to see yourself as the freak who doesn't want to participate and yet the freak that if you don't participate, you're still going to be the freak, right? And so how do you engage in culture when they just look like they know what they're doing? They look like this is what you do at work. You, this is how you get a promotion. This is how you find favor. This is how you get along with other people. And the question becomes, is that really what God intends for his children? Number two, the other thing that verse 18 says of culture or says of false teachers is this. They appeal to sinful human desires. I mean, that's just the fact. We are sinful beings. We are marred by sin. We do not have to be overcome by sin, especially if we have entered into a relationship with Jesus. We no longer are overcome by sin because Jesus has paid the penalty of that sin. And so we do not have to live in a life of condemnation because Jesus is our victor. That is the incredible, perfect, awesome, happy, joyful story of the gospel. But... As we live our lives influenced by all sorts of things, the reality is culture and false teachers, they 
they lean you into the desires of your flesh. It's not that Satan's making you do it. It's that your flesh is crying out for the old way of life. It was really interesting. I was on the plane um, this week, and you guys are probably very familiar with Circus de Soleil, and it's an awesome production of incredible, in amazing things, and Southwest Airlines had that highlighted because obviously Southwest goes to Vegas a lot, and there's all kinds of different shows. There's the aquatic show, and there's the circus more type ringmaster show, and there's all kinds of things, and I noticed that there's a new show that they have out that's called Zumanity, and I really know nothing about it except the, the tagline of it is the sensual um, conception of Circus de Soleil. So it's basically a pretty risque burlesque type of movement in, in this, right? Well, someone who is fascinated with the beauty of the human body that, that is Circus de Soleil, I mean, they do amazing things, and you're in awe of the amazing things that they do. I mean, they have performances at SeaWorld, right? I mean, it's, it's you like, this is cool stuff. And yet, as you think through the process, culture then pushes the boundary and pushes the boundary and pushes the boundary so that you then find yourself in basically a great production strip show, right? And that's what it is. How does it get into us? It gets into us because our flesh cries out for those sorts of things. We have to engage in the relationship that we have with Christ so that we can overcome those things and not be enticed really by our own flesh, by our own natural desires. The third thing that verse 18 then says is this. They strongly defend that their path is the true path of freedom. They argue that the gospel is bondage and controlling. What conversations have you been in? You, if you were just open-minded, if you just truly understand what it was like to exist in freedom, then you would engage in that activity. Then you would be okay with this activity. Then you would be fine with doing this. And you can, you know, draw the line in the sand in all kinds of different places, but culture pushes us to compromise. Because as we compromise, then, they tell us, we experience true freedom. What they tell us is that the gospel is confining, the gospel is restrictive, the gospel is legalistic, the gospel is judgmental. How dare you think that way? Humanity has evolved in such a way that we don't think that way anymore. Put yourself in those situations and see the tantalizing seduction of culture. It's there. They're the experts. They appeal to your desires, and they offer freedom. Who doesn't want that? If you struggle with weight, and then you see on TV, which I saw today, by somewhat respectable individual that says, you don't even have to work at it, and you're going to start, start dropping pounds like that. Well, isn't that what we want to do? Is, isn't that they're the experts? right? They appeal to our natural desires. Well, who doesn't want to look like fill in the blank? And then they promise us that if you figure this system out, you will experience true freedom. You don't ever have to work out. Now, that's a very simplistic illustration, but it goes everywhere. In every part of your experience, isn't that what the world offers? And so what does it look like for you to say, no, the world offers this, but Jesus offers something more. Remember the premise of these false teachers in Peter's letter is that there's no second coming, which means if there's no second coming, there's no judgment, which means morality is irrelevant. You see, the false teachers or culture, or culture tries to teach us that people can live however they wish since judgment is an illusion. The door has been opened, allowing sexual sin at every level. As you read verse 18 again with me, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. 
Verse 19 then speaks in this way, if people cannot overcome certain habits and sins, they are slaves to such things. It's not the gospel that holds us as slaves. It's actually culture and the sinful desires of men. How could the teachers proclaim a message of freedom when they were unable to show that they themselves can get rid of sin is basically what Peter's saying. He's saying they offer freedom, but really what they are is they're enslaved. They're captured. They're in the revolving door of sinful desires. Their lifestyle basically contradicts their message. What does it look like for your lifestyle? What does it look like for you as a child of God to not contradict the message of the gospel? For you to be a person that understands the presence of Christ in your life, for you to be a person that experiences holiness in a, in a new and real and free sort of way that you don't see holiness as restrictive, you see holiness as experiencing what? The fullness of God. How do you experience Jesus in the everyday so that your lifestyle is consistent with the beauty of the message of truth that Jesus offers us? You see, the counterpart of that, the question that even haunts us as believers is what are you still enslaved by? What still holds you captive? The truth is, your past may hold you captive. Um, I know several people that as they are processing life and as they're trying to get to the bottom of why they react in certain situations, that as they reflect on their past, what they discover is, you know, there are holes in my past that I don't even remember. And the fact of the matter is that the human brain does tremendous things to try to protect you as a being, and so the brain blocks some of those memories. And what does it look like to, not in a negative way, but to explore those things so that you can find freedom from the past? Maybe the present is what's holding you captive. Maybe you have found yourself in just a cyclical type of reality that that particular sin or that particular habit or that particular relationship is just absolutely toxic. And what does it mean for you in the present to begin to ask yourself, how will I experience true freedom? You've heard this illustration a thousand times. In some ways, I hesitate because it's such a cheesy illustration, but it's just true, right? How do they catch monkeys? You've heard it, right? You put a small hole in a coconut, and you put a peanut in the coconut, and then the monkey reaches his fist in to grab the peanut, and he won't let go of the peanut, right? And so then he has this big thing on his hand, and so it's harder for him to run away, and so they throw a net on him, right? Now, it's a super cheesy illustration, and you've probably heard it a thousand different times, but that monkey is so stubborn that his freedom is in his, it's in his hand. All he has to do is let go, and he can run. Do you find yourself in that situation right now in the present, that you have something so tight that you are unwilling to let it go, and it is causing you complete and total enslavement. And what would it feel like? What would it be, even as hard and as difficult as it might be, to let go of the peanut? To let go of that thing that you find your identity, to let go of that thing that relieves stress, to let go of that thing that causes you some sort of carnal comfort, and how do you allow the Spirit of God to begin to give you freedom, not that particular vice? What keeps you enslaved? Verses 20 through the end of the chapter then gives an illustration of dogs and pigs. Peter warns his readers that they should not travel the road that those who have been seduced have traveled, for it is a road that descends deep, steeply and quickly, and climbing upwards again is virtually impossible, probably because those who have descended no longer desire 
to return. When I read this, you kind of get trapped in some potential theological traps. You're like, wait, is he talking about believers or not believers? And they can't get back. And you go back and forth through all this stuff. But again, um, I was very proud of myself when I was in San Francisco. I, I had determined I am going to be consistent in exercising, even though my schedule's crazy and everything's going on. And so I was, and I was super excited that I was. And part of my routine is running. And running in San Francisco, obviously there's hills, right? And hills are, can be hard, especially if you haven't done hills before. And there's something about some of the hills. And if you don't know how to run down a hill, you can just start rolling down a hill, right? Now, fortunately enough, I wasn't going to try to get down to the hill the fastest. But if you find yourself on something steep and you can't catch yourself, the momentum will carry you away. And what Peter is talking about here is that identity to say, you start going down this slippery slope and you end up at the bottom. And then as you end up at the bottom, you look up and you think to yourself, it's just easier to stay where I am. It's too hard to climb back out of this hole. I'll just make my life happy at the bottom. But see, that's not happiness, and that's not freedom. You're still caught at the bottom of the well. You just hang a picture and you say, oh, look at that, and it'll remind me of a day that I used to exist. But that's not freedom. And so what Peter is saying about dogs and pigs is a very in-your-face illustration of the reality that humans begin to feel satisfied with vomit and mud. That's it. Are you satisfied with vomit and mud? Is the life that you're living now so enslaved you that vomit looks like a ribeye? And so you eat it. I've used this gross illustration about my dog before, and I'll use it again to get the point across. What is it about my dog that when he looks at the poop that he just pooped, he thinks, I'm going to eat that again? <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. I don't, I, I don't know what goes through his brain. Something does, and he enjoys it. It grosses me out. And yet, I read scripture, and what Peter says to me is you have replaced what God is wanting to give you with vomit and mud. I'm no different than my dog. Ouch. Ouch. What does it look like for you to not be pacified, for you to not feel fulfilled by what culture has to offer? Is sex better according to God? Are relationships better according to God? Are family structures better according to God? Is church family better according to God? Is civilization better according to God? What is better according to God? And how do we as God's children, as the people who are to live this life so that we pray and plead and proclaim, let your kingdom come? How is your life better? It should be. Not easier, better. Your life won't be easy, but it'll be better. What does it look like to engage in that sort of reality with the freedom that is given with the gospel? Before we move into chapter 3, I'm going to pause. And so I want you to reflect. I want you to look at two weeks ago and ask yourself some of the hard questions that maybe that message represented in your life. And what does it look like for you to think about the enticement of culture? What does it look like to think through the rest of chapter 2 and as you process to begin to engage in the different stations? It may affect the art that you represent in the collaborative collage. It may affect how you approach the Lord's table when it comes to communion. It may affect the story that you want to tell and the image that is so vivid in your mind as you try to release yourself from the things that are holding you captive. You're going to have some time, so take the time. And this experience now is up to you and up to the people that you involve in your journey of worship together as the church. So over the next 10 minutes or so, 
spend time with God, engaging in his word and engaging in other worship experiences. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1, you can. Um, you can also just write it down, take note on the whole idea of freedom. You know, the question for us is, what are we thinking is something great and it's actually vomit or mud? And the reality is that true freedom is only experienced by the redemptive and transformative work of Christ. And so as you begin to process true freedom, we spent a long time in Exodus talking about redemption, and maybe you need to think through that journey that we took about God's people and, and the Exodus. As you think about what does it mean for me to live a transformed life, for me to be different because the Spirit of God is in your life. If you look at Isaiah chapter 1, the first eight verses really just describe um, the wickedness of Judah. Um, verse 5 says, Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. I mean, think about this description that's given in the book of Isaiah of what does it mean for someone who's wrestling with where do I find freedom? Then in verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 1, it says, If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors... We should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. There's this whole theology woven throughout all of Scripture of the remnant. That God is saving a remnant of his people to establish the glory of his name across generations. To continue to leave a powerful presence of his kingdom on this earth so that people will find redemption, so that people will find transformation, so that people will find the truth of the gospel. And when you look at Isaiah chapter 1, it turns at verse 9 and it begins to talk about that God is saving a remnant. The fact of the matter is, I don't know if you've thought of yourself this way, but you yourself can be, we as a community can be a remnant for the city of Tucson? What does it look like for God to use you and cherish you and build you up together as a body to provide an opportunity for people to witness the reality of freedom? True, biblical, holy freedom. It then continues in verse 18. It says, Come, now let us reason together, says the Lord, Though your sins are like scarlet, here comes the grace that is given to the remnant. They shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." As you begin to think about what God offers and how he chooses to move, he wants you to experience freedom. He has offered you an ability through his son Jesus to truly live a life of fullness and transformation. So as you think through those questions and as you continue to process through your own worship experiences, here are more questions to add. How do you cherish the forgiveness of sin? How have you shown gratefulness for your freedom? How do you rejoice in the beauty of 
your salvation? What motivates you to be willing and obedient in response to the truth of Scripture? As you think about these questions, it moves us from the turmoil of redemption is the only hope for our culture. We live in a sick and depraved and twisted and unbelievably wounded place, and yet we can begin to see a hope that's there. We can begin to see that God has set aside a remnant, that God wants to speak through his people, that God wants us to truly understand and move in an area of experiencing his salvation. So where's the beauty? Where's the rejoicing? Where's the gratefulness? Where's the motivation of living an obedient and a responsive life? Where do you find it as a child of God? Peter then moves us out of chapter 2 into chapter 3, and so we find ourselves in chapter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring you, stirring up your sincere mind by way of, here it comes, reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished but by the same word the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. We are then moved into this reality that the direction of our culture should not be something that surprises us. You should not be in shock when you watch the news. You shouldn't be overwhelmed by the presence of culture, by the presence of false teaching. What Peter says is don't let this so bind you that you're incapable of action. My grandmother is now in her 80s, and she has a pretty sedentary lifestyle, and that's a whole nother story, but she finds herself captive in her own house because the only view that she gets of the world is through the news. I mean, think about it. If you never left your home, and you only watched KVOA or KGUN, and on occasion you watch CNN, and once in a while, you got to Brian Williams or whoever your favorite news anchor is. If you only listened to that, how much joy would be in your life? How much hope would there be? You wouldn't want to go outside of your home either. You see, that's a certain perspective of the world in which we live. And although culture is twisted and culture is moving us towards all kinds of things that are not in tandem with the gospel, God has revealed himself. You never doubt whether the sun will rise or set. You never doubt whether you'll engage in love or in hope or in the joy of fill in the blank. There are little subtleties to the beauty of creation and the beauty of God in relationship with that creation. And so what does it mean for you to not be surprised. We should see it coming. And this reality, if properly understood, should then stir something within us. So what should it stir? As we view the world and as we're not surprised by culture and as we kind of turn the dial from darkness to hope, what should remain in the heart of a believer? Well, the first thing that should remain is compassion. What does it mean for you to be compassionate towards a culture that does not yet know Christ? What does it mean to practice the skill of listening, to be more concerned about hearing the needs of the people around you than voicing your opinion of fill in the blank? What does it mean to listen to the needs of the people around you even above and beyond correcting the fact that they're absolutely wrong? <laughs> That's when it gets hard. 
That as you begin to initiate in relationships and they begin to share a worldview with you, that your tendency is to absolutely reject that worldview and say, you are so wrong. But what does it mean for you to come alongside that individual and be in the type of relationship that over time, then you're able to begin to speak glimpses of hope and truth and a different perspective and worldview? What does it mean for you to engage in those types of things? What does it mean for you to develop a heart of compassion? I think I've shared this story with some of you before. When Angel and I first went to East Asia, it was during our summer. It was before we had lived there for two years. And we were so excited to spend a summer in East Asia witnessing to people and telling people about the glory of Christ and talking to them about Jesus who loved them, even though they may have never heard of this name Jesus before. And that was a reality. We saw people that had never heard the name of Jesus and had conversations with them. And these two guys came to our dorm and there was all these people kind of in and out of our dorm and people were talking about all kinds of things things in American culture and Chinese culture and everything that was happening. And these two guys were really interested and they were asking me and this other person lots and lots and lots of questions. And somehow that arrived in just the education system between the two countries. And they began to talk about communism and then that moved to evolution. And I immediately just camped out on that and, and in my zealousness and in my ignorance just went for the juggler and started talking about creation. And it just erupted in this whole thing. And they were polite and they were engaged and they were talking and I never saw them again. I think I was effective in sharing the love and patience and compassion of the truth of the gospel in their lives. I don't think so. What does it mean for us to develop compassion? Now what's difficult is compassion then, number two, has to move us towards urgency. If you're compassionate, if you care, if you love, if you bring someone in, there's urgency. There's a time that says, hey, my child has to learn to fill in the blank. It's urgent. I love them. I have compassion for them. But depending on their age, they have to learn this. They have to learn this. They have to learn this. You know, whatever it is. And as you think about your own life and you think about the interactions of the relationships that you have with this culture, what does it look like for you to say, I deeply care for you and so there's an urgency. So I must open my mouth. I must share the love of Christ, not in a desperate way, not in a confrontational way, not in a way of anger, but in a true, loving, compassionate sort of way, which then leads us to The third, not only should we be compassionate because of our view of culture, not only should we be urgent because of our view of culture, but we should be expectant. We should anticipate. We should believe in faith that the people in whom we are interacting with, guess what? They will actually change. That we serve a God that has the ability to transform lives. What does Peter start with? Remember. Remember. You know, the power of memory is incredibly powerful. Right now, think about the most amazing food that you've ever had. Where were you? What was it? What was that first bite like? How long did it take you to finish the plate? How many people did you talk to about it after you were done? You're there. Those of you that are parents, what was it like to experience the birth of your children. For some, that memory is painful, but it's there. For some, that memory is joyful, but it's there. For some, it's both, but it's there. There's power of memory. What was it like when you felt so accomplished through work, through school, through peer relationships, You can go immediately to that memory. And what Peter says to us is, remember the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel transformed you. Remember that moment in your life where the old disappeared and the new came in. That moment when you knew my sin has been forgiven. I now experience hope and truth, and the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Remember that. Why are you the way that you are now because of the gospel? You see, 
culture moves a believer to be compassionate, to be urgent, and to remember that we expect people to change. You did. And you were no different than anybody that you interact with on a daily basis. I am no different than the people that I interact with on a daily basis. The only hope that I have is that I somehow have been able to engage in the reality and the understanding of the gospel. So how do you move your relationships to a place where God grabs a hold of their lives and begins to change them towards his ways? Peter says to us in the first verse of chapter 3, I am writing to you, beloved, beloved, dear friends. Peter, as Shannon talked about, Peter's heart as a shepherd. He is saying the most tender of words to his audience. Who is he talking to? Who is Peter trying to get to understand this is what this is about? It's you, brothers and sisters, family, the people that I am the most willing to come alongside and to see the hope of Christ in my life. Come with me, dear friends. But he says, don't be surprised, verse 2, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. It's going to happen. They'll say things like this. We've talked about it a lot today already. If God is so good, then where is he? This isn't a new question, guys. For thousands of years, people have said that. Peter records, for thousands of years, this is what people say about God. And guess what? It doesn't raise the anxiety levels of God. God is not anxious going, oh, I wonder what people think about me. We're the ones that are anxious. So what does it look like to embrace the steadfastness of God? To say, I will do as my Father does. And to not be anxious, but to engage in compassion and urgency and anticipation. So as you think through some of these questions, how do you respond to those who mock your faith? Have you ever been mocked because of your faith? So how do you respond to the mocking of your faith? And then the question becomes, well, have you had an opportunity to respond? Have you, have you ever been mocked for your faith? Which then leads to an even more difficult question. If you haven't been mocked for your faith, does this represent a subtle truth that you may not be bold in your faith? Ouch. You see, you should expect mocking. Not because you're rude, not because you're selfish, not because you're unloving, not because you don't anticipate and expect change. In fact, you should be mocked because, guess what? You are compassionate, and you are urgent, and you do expect change. So if we're not, as the body of Christ, experiencing mocking, not because we're stupid, but because we're faithful, why aren't we? <laughs> How are we living our lives according to the urgency of Scripture? The final question there is then, how can you be strong in your faith, yet gentle and respectful? Netflix is a fun place. Many of you have already started watching the things that I talk about, and I always have to be careful, no, and then I say something, and then the next episode, I'm like, why did I ever say you should watch that? And, you know, whatever. So this one's pretty safe. It's Caesar Milan. You know who that is? The great and mighty dog whisperer, right? Well, guess what? He's on Netflix now. I was so excited. I was looking for things to do um, in San Francisco when I was just laying in my dorm room going, wow, I wish I could be with my family. And guess what? There was Caesar. And so I watched several episodes of The Dog Whisperer, and I kind of like that whole idea of training your dog and being obedient and what does that look like and how do you move through that. And I really believe that Caesar has this whole strong presence yet gentle and respectful. I really believe it. And that there's a reality in that. And you guys know that his whole thing is, 
right? You've been there? He's snapping the dog's mind out of where they are to get to what? A calm and submissive state. That's, that's his thing. And every dog needs what? Needs exercise, then discipline, then love. And if you're giving your dog love before you give them exercise and discipline, you're going in the wrong direction. All right, everybody got the lesson? Okay, good. But what's the point of this illustration? The point is when Caesar is engaged in a dog, which he calls a red zone dog, which will bite your face off, right? That's kind of the red zone dog. He takes action. He is strong and he represents to that dog, I will dominate you. You will listen. But he's never mean. He's always calm and it's like weird calm. It's like you're not scared that this dog is about to bite your face off and he gains control and no matter how much the dog wrestles and, and moves and tries to get out of control, Caesar just maintains that firm respect. It's that, and he talks about it's that, um, I can't even think of the word, it's like just calm, um, strong and assertive behavior. Now that's a dog show and some of you are like who cares? But I think the illustration is good when it comes to our faith. Because if you give the boldness of your faith in your environments, there is going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth around you. Because no one likes to be confronted with truth. But our response to that is not how some of us have responded to dogs that are out of control. And I'm guilty of that too, right? We get angry, we get impatient, we're like, ah, we lash out. So that's not how we should respond. What we should respond with, as scripture says, is with gentleness and respect. When culture begins to thrash, we're still calm and assertive and there, but we're engaging with gentleness and respect. And so as you think about being mocked, as you think about what does it look like for you to be bold, Think about how do you become strong in your faith, yet gentle and respectful. Peter's argument against the scoffers, it's really interesting. We're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I will tell you. He gives three reasons of why um, these scoffers are wrong. So Peter gives intelligent um, descriptions of this. He outlines it in verses 3 through 7. The first is this, the creation of the world represents divine intervention. And so as you read through this, Peter says, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come, verse 4, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. They just assume, hey, the life goes on, the world goes on, the sun comes up, it goes down, life is there, where is God in all of that? And what Peter is saying is, hey, you're missing out on the fact that creation started because God started it. And so that's Peter's first argument. Initial creation and the order that is experienced. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says this, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The universe operates because of Jesus. It's amazing. And Peter is saying, the world happens in its regularity because of the majesty of Christ. The second, then, is this, the flood. As Peter continues, he says, For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of this the, wor the world that even existed was deluged with water and perished. Peter is referencing the flood. God stepped back into his creation and chaos returned by the destroying of everyone except Noah and his family. Again, a remnant was left. What the flood functioned as is as an anticipation of the judgment that would come with fire. So then he gives a third and final proof, verse 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Peter says the third argument against these mockers is that Jesus will intervene again in the future. He will return. And he says and he warns, false teachers, unless they repent, would realize too late that the judgment was no myth. 
and that God does intervene in the world. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15 and 16 says this, For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. It doesn't seem like that's a pretty picture, but it was really interesting as I continued to study through, Peter uses the image of water two different times, and then he switches to the image of fire. And there's some reality of why he does that. The, the first real subtle fun kind of thing, if you like this sort of thing, is that what did God promise? He would never destroy the earth by water again. And so the final judgment throughout all of Scripture is described as fire. There's a reason, because God is staying true to his word, that he's not going to destroy the earth as he did with Noah, but he's going to move in cooperation with what the end judgment will be. So as you think about reminder, and as you look into the stations one last time, this is what I want you to remember. James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24 say this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he looks like. So here are the questions. What practices have you established that facilitate remembrance? What do you find yourself most often needing to be reminded of concerning your faith? Who are the people in your life that bring you assurance? And how can you thank them this week for their encouragement? Mm 